How you doing, Year Tens, and welcome to another video. These videos are on Unit Two. What are the bonding models? Make sure you've got a pen, highlighter, highlight all the highlights, copy down all the annotations. Make sure that you've logged on to Educanon and answered all the questions. Now let's get into the videos. Unit two, what are the bonding models? How are the properties linked to atomic structure? And we look specifically at ionic in this video. The understanding and outcomes, we need to draw and label a 2D representation of an ionic bond. We need to state and explain what holds an ionic bond together. We need to be able to describe some of the properties. And then we get into formula writing, which is the most important part of this particular video. The Oxford text, page 244, 247, check it out. Okay, so the ionic bonding model. Well, first of all, an ionic compound contains a metal cation and a non-metal anion formed from an electron transfer reaction, which we talked about last week, our last video. So we've got the model on the left, which shows cations surrounded by anions and anions surrounded by cations. The attraction of the positive ions and the negative ions holds this lattice together. Now the electrostatic attraction is described as the attraction between something that's positively charged and something that is negatively charged. So we have the cations in the lattice which are attracted to the anions in the lattice and each of those is surrounded by the opposite one. So we get this strong electrostatic force of attraction. Up there is a 3D model, we're asked to draw a 2D model um, and we're going to use calcium oxide as an example. So when you draw this, you need to make sure that you label the ions. So calcium will be a two plus ion. So when I write, when I draw in my sphere for my calcium ion, I need to label it Ca2 plus. I'm gonna draw those in first, and they're in kind of like a brick pattern. So they're not right next to each other. They're separated by the anions. So it's kind of like cation, anion, cation, anion. So here I'm putting in my calcium ions with a charge as well and I'm putting them slightly off centre because we're looking for that brick pattern. Then I need to draw in my anions, my oxide ions. So oxide has the charge 2 minus so I come along and put those between the calcium cations because they are the anions and then we get this positive negative positive negative ions being built up which is referred to as the ionic lattice. Then I have to properly label my diagram, so I have my calcium cations labelled and my oxide anions labelled. Positive, negative, stuck together, electrostatic force of attraction holds this compound together. Okay, we need to talk about some of the properties and the first property is the melting point. So how do we use the model to describe the melting point? And we're going to use sodium chloride as an example. So the sodium ones are the little silver ones and the chloride ones are the big green ones. So I'm going to let you have a quick look at this video so check it out and then you'll come back straight to me and we'll talk about the reasons. What happens when an ionic compound is heated? At around 800 degrees Celsius, this salt turns into a liquid. In our model, we see what's happening. As the individual ions gain energy, they reach a point where their energy of motion, or kinetic energy, overcomes the ionic bonds. As the lattice breaks down, the ions begin to move independently of each other to some extent. The salt is now in a liquid state. One of the effects... So it takes a large amount of energy to turn a ionic compound from a solid into a liquid. We have to heat it on the Bunsen burner for a long period of time into a very high temperature. So that means that the forces between the anions and the cations must be very strong. And we say that the ionic bond is a strong bond. 
it takes a large amount of force to overcome that electrostatic attraction. The force here is the heat. Hardness and brittleness, well hardness is how hard it is to scratch the surface and brittleness is what happens when you hit it with a force or a hammer. What happens when a salt crystal is subjected to a force? Unlike a piece of metal, the crystal won't bend or twist. We can see what happens in this model of the crystal. The sodium and chloride ions in the lattice are not interchangeable. They have opposite charges and any attempt to change their positions must overcome the electrostatic forces that hold them together. If the outside force applied is great enough, then we can see why the crystal will instantly shatter. When a section is forced this far, ions carrying like charges are suddenly next to each other. They'll be strongly repelled, shearing the crystal along this line and breaking it apart. A powerful outside force will cause this to happen throughout the crystal and reduce it to dust. Each fragment of salt, though, no matter how small, will still be made of a regular ionic lattice. What tends to happen here is when we slide the layers past each other, adjacent positively charged and adjacent negatively charged ions will align. So we'll have negative, negative, positive, positive, instead of having the negative, positive alternating. When that happens, we get repulsion between the layers and then the crystal just breaks apart. So in terms of hardness, ionic compounds are hard to scratch, but they are brittle because when you apply a force, those ions can come adjacent to each other and the crystal can repel and it shatters. Electrical conductivity is does it conduct electricity? Now in the solid form, an ionic crystal has no free moving particles. So there's nothing in there that can conduct electricity and they don't conduct electricity. However, when the solid melts or is dissolved in water, the ions in the ionic compound are now free to move. When the ions are free to move, they could be attracted to either a positively charged nucleus or a negatively charged electrode, I mean. So in the solution, the negatives will move towards the positive electrode and the positives will move towards the negative electrode. We call that a migration of ions. So to conduct electricity, either molten or liquid, we must have free moving charged particles to carry the current. And in this case, the ions are the free moving charged particles when it's either molten or dissolved. The free moving charged particles are the ions, and in this case, they're migrating towards one of the electrodes, either the negatively charged electrode or the positively charged electrode. One of the key points for electrical conductivity is only substances with moving charged particles are able to conduct electricity. And there's two types of charged particles. We can have delocalized electrons in metals, which we'll talk about in the next video, or we have ions that are able to move in a solution. So the important thing about this video is how we write ionic formulas. Remember an ionic compound contains a metal and a non-metal and this is a key skill that needs to be carried through year 10, 11 and 12. So we write the formula for an ionic compound by combining both the cation and the anion and writing the ionic formula. But the ionic formula will never have an overall charge, it will be neutral. So the charges need to cancel out. So for instance, potassium chloride. Potassium is in group one, so it has one electron in the outer shell, it's got a one plus charge. Chloride, Cl minus, also has a one plus charge. The two charges cancel each other out, so we can simply put them together, KCl. Sodium, sodium is in group one, plus one. Oxide, minus two. Now we have an imbalance in the charge here, so I need another sodium ion to balance out the extra charge on the oxide, and I write that as Na2O, two sodiums. Calcium fluoride, calcium is Ca2+, fluoride is F-, minus. so the same type of problem. I need two fluorines to balance the charge on the calcium, so it's CaF2. 
Lithium bromide, lithium is Li plus and bromide is Br minus. So when I stick those two things together, the charge cancels out, LiBr. Magnesium sulfate, magnesium is 2 plus, sulfide is S2 minus. So again, the 2 plus and the 2 minus cancel each other out, so the formula is MgS. Another one of the key understandings is for some of the transition metals. And you need to know the charge on some of the transition metals. In particular, iron, nickel, copper, zinc, and silver. Now nickel is an Ni2 plus iron. It always forms 2 plus. Zinc also forms 2 plus. Silver will form a 1 plus cation. Now if we have some Roman numerals next to an element, that tells us the charge. So here we have iron 2 plus and iron 3 plus. The same with the copper, the Roman numeral represents the charge. We have copper plus and copper 2 plus. So to write the formula for nickel sulfide, nickel is a 2 plus iron and sulfide is a 2 minus iron, so they will cancel each other out nicely to give us NIS. Iron 3 oxide, iron will be 3 plus and oxide will be O2 minus. Now we've got to try and find a common factor here. A simple trick is to swap the charges over. And by the charges I mean we'll have to have two of the ions and three of the oxides. So the formula will be Fe2O3. Copper 2 chloride, the copper will be 2 plus and the chloride is 1 minus. So I need two of the chlorides to balance out the charge, CuCl2. Making it a little bit more challenging are things called diatomic ions. And diatomic ions contain more than one atom. And these are some that you need to commit to memory, especially in year 11 or 12. But as part of year 10, you get them in the data booklet. So the nitrate ion is described as NO3-1-. The hydroxide, OH-. The carbonate, CO3-2-. Ammonium is the only cation on the, on the list, NH4+. Phosphate, PO4, 3 minus. Hydrogen carbonate, HCO3 minus. And sulfate is SO4, 2 minus. These particular ions are harder to write because we need to take into account that we, if we need more than one of them, we need more, we need to include brackets because we need more than just one of the atoms. So for instance, when we write these ones, we will need to introduce some brackets. And the brackets will be used when we need more than one of the diatomic ions. So sodium nitrate will be Na plus and NO3 minus. The plus and the minus cancel each other out, so the formula is NaNO3. Sodium carbonate. Sodium is a 1 plus ion and the carbonate is CO3 2 minus. So to balance the charge on the carbonate, I'm going to need two sodiums. Because sodium is only one atom, it's Na2CO3. Magnesium nitrate is the first one we need to use brackets for. The nitrate is NO3 minus, and that doesn't balance all the charge on the magnesium. So I need another nitrate ion, and I need the whole thing. So the way we write that is the magnesium, and then I put brackets, NO3, to say that I need two of the NO3, and the two goes on the outside of the brackets. Calcium sulfate, calcium is 2 plus and sulfate is 2 minus, so they will nicely cancel each other out. I don't need brackets for that one, CaSO4. Calcium hydroxide, hydroxide is a negatively one charged diatomic ion, so again I need two of the hydroxides to balance out the charge on the calcium, so I need to include the brackets with the two outside the brackets. Ammonium oxide, ammonium is NH4 plus and oxide is O2 minus. So I need two ammonium ions to balance the charge on the oxide. So I need to include brackets at the start here. The NH4 is in brackets, I need two of them and then the O at the end. We always write the cation and then the anion. Potassium hydrogen carbonate, the hydrogen carbonate anion is minus one charge. That cancels out with potassium, so I can put those straight together, KHCO3. Silver phosphate, silver is a 1 plus ion, phosphate is a 
three minus ion, so that means I'm going to need three silvers. Don't need brackets because it's just a monoatomic ion, Ag3PO4. We also need to be able to go backwards, so we need to be able to write the names from the formula of the ionic compound. The ones that we need to be careful of are the ones that are transition metals, where we need to use a Roman numeral. So if it's a transition metal that has a different charge, we must use the Roman numerals. So, for instance, the first one, LiCl, is lithium chloride. Lithium is not a transition metal, so I don't need Roman numerals. Its name is just lithium chloride. Zinc, zinc is a transition metal, but it only has one charge. It's only the two plus. So this will be called zinc chloride. The one down here though, FeO, well oxygen, the oxide is minus two. That means the iron must be plus two. So here I do need to use Roman numerals. Iron two oxide. The next one, we've got the different form of iron. We've got Fe2O3, which means the iron must be the 3 plus iron. So I need to represent the Roman numerals to say that they have a different charge. FeO and Fe2O3 are different molecules. The last one, we have copper bromide. The bromide is 1 minus, which means the copper must be 1 plus. So that would be copper 1 bromide. Thanks for watching Year 10s, don't forget, drop a like on the video, subscribe if you're new, and I'll see you next time.